Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. The Bible reads, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Amen. Pray for us? Yeah. Let's pray, please. Uh, dear Lord, I pray that you please um, bless uh, uh, the sermon, Lord. Uh, I pray that you'd um, fill Brother uh, Gander with your spirit. And I uh, pray, Lord, that you please uh, help us all to be attentive to it. And uh, we ask these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> We're going to get back to Romans chapter 13 there in a little bit. Um, if anyone knows is familiar with Romans chapter 13, it's all about being subject unto the higher powers. <clears throat> what I want to talk about today is... Hey, get in church. Hey, get in church. The hey there being the express, like, hey, come on, come on, let's go. Let's let's get in church. This is important here. This isn't this isn't just an aside thing. This isn't just uh, a, a side, you know, this is kind of a minor issue. Hey, get in church. It's it's vitally important. But these days we have so many people that don't think that's the true case. They don't think that's the truth. They'll say things like Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. Yeah. Quite often you'll see zealous Christians will point to what they call a lame congregation or a lame church or a lame pastor and they'll be like, Ah, I hate evil every evil way. But the pride and the arrogancy I find more often is on those zealous Christians I would say that if you're pushing away, if you're fighting, if you're saying, hey, I hate the ways of that congregation just for the sake of hating the ways of that congregation, you are the lame Christian who is looking to perhaps, and very well, you can criticize and say they may be a lacking congregation, but you're looking to them, and I believe it makes you a lame Christian yourself. I entitled this at one point, I said, you know, hey, lame -o, get in church, or, or hey, loser, get in church. I believe this is a message that needs to be preached because it needs to be preached hard because if we learned anything about what happened in the recent weeks, if anyone was involved in the internet debacle and, and how a church basically came to naught because the pastor fell, but thanks be to God, it's still alive, it's still well. But if we learned anything from the aftermath, first and foremost, yes, you've got to guard your heart. You've got to be watching your back. You've got to be making sure you're being spiritual and you're not getting sucked into the carnal works of the flesh. But secondly, 
You need to recognize that the people that fell, the people that didn't survive, the people that didn't last, the people that were cast away in this circumstance and in this situation, wasn't the congregation that lost their pastor because they regained a pastor and they're right back where they were started from. The people that lost, fell, and, and were destroyed and were cast away through this were those lame, loser Christians who weren't in church to begin with. Why? Because they were on a foundation that was not the Lord Jesus Christ. They were on a foundation that wasn't the truth, the pillar and ground of the truth. They weren't settled. They weren't established. They weren't in a congregation when all this happened. And now we're seeing one after another, after another, after another of church forsakers falling away. And now they're, they're, they're fellowshipping with whomever. They're, they're pushing away from those that were their friends. They're pushing away from all the things that they once stood on. And now they're just, they're just blowing in the wind. Uh, yeah, fellowship forsakers quite often have examples. They quite often have reasons for why they're not in church. They'll say, oh, well, that church is lame. They'll say, oh, well, that church doesn't do soul winning. They'll say, oh, well, that church sells books at the back. They'll say, oh, that church is pre-trip. They'll say, that pastor doesn't like Pastor Stephen Anderson. They'll have all these different reasons as to why they're not in church. And you know what? Honestly, they have to have pretty good reasons, and they have to have pretty good arguments and attacks, because many of these guys live five minutes away from the churches that they're attacking. That's right. They, they're, they're right there on the doorstep. So they got to have some pretty good slander. they got to have some pretty good reasons. they got to have some pretty good negatives that they can throw at this church to justify themselves why they're not walking across the, church, the street and attending a church. Any church is better than no church. Any church is better than no church. And I'm speaking from experience. When I was first saved, I spent the entirety of that first year... Uh, reading the Bible. I had prayed for an opportunity to read the Bible, such a daunting book. I thought that I would never, ever, ever complete it. And once you know, God had in, my, in the plans for my life that I would get into an accident at work, into a pretty serious car accident, end up with whiplash, spending the next five or six months having to stand with really good posture, keeping my neck strengthened while doing exercises. And outside on my back porch, there was a, a, a railing that held the Bible right at this height. And I sat there with my eyes looking down and my head in that right posture, reading the Bible over and over and over. Five times I got through the scriptures, three times front to back. I stepped into church because I recognized that the Bible talks a lot about it. And it took me a year to come to that conclusion because I was essentially on my own with the Spirit of God ministering to me through His Word. And so when I realized that it was important that I be in church according to the scriptures, I just figured, I'll go to Grandma's church. It was a United Church of Canada congregation. I stepped into a church that had a woman preacher who called herself reverend. Okay, I walked into this church, and by all accounts, I was an independent, fundamental, King James-only, Bible-believing Christian, but I didn't have that title yet. By all accounts, I was a Bible believer, and yet I stepped into a church like that. And do you know what I did when I was in that church? I was a blessing. I got involved in the ministry. I did everything I could to help out, to support, to do all sorts of things. When I had issues with the, with the leadership, I went privately and talked about these things in private. Yeah, I was basically the wolf. They would have looked at me as like the most evil guy in the world because I believed the Bible. And I was like, doesn't the Bible say that you shouldn't be preaching? Right? But while I was there, I ministered to people. I helped people out. I got involved with the youth. I got involved with the kids. I was leading the music. I was playing guitar with a grand piano for almost eight months of my life there. I did the best I could in the position that I was in. And eventually I was all but run out of the place, basically with flaming, flaming torches and pitchforks by the time they finally got me out of there. And in that situation, actually, that minister tried so desperately to rip my wife and I apart, and for a time, uh, convincing her that I was some sort of delusional psychopath, my wife not being saved at that time. But all that to say this, any church is better than no church. Because while I was there, I grew. While I was there, I learned what it meant to get along with people, to minister to people, to see people, to have people see me. That's important. And, and, and I grew from there. Next, I survived in a repent of your sins after I was running out of that. A repentant spectrum church. Okay? It took me a long time to figure out what my pastor actually believed. But for two or three or many more years, I served 
in an independent, fundamental Baptist church. That's where I was baptized. That's where I began to really take leaps and bounds on the scriptures. That's when I really began to learn about what a church service looks like. I began to learn about singing congregational hymns. I led congregational hymns. I started to preach. I was ministered to. I ministered. I grew leaps and bounds in that church. But a lot of people would look at that and say, ah, that church is lame. Ah, that church is repent of your sins. After twisting his arm, I realized that he's very, very heavy into that doctrine. Ah, that church sells books at the back. Ah, that church does specials. But hey, if you're going to say all those things about that church, and your option is to just not go to church, you're wicked, that's wrong. Hey, loser, get in church. I learned in those situations how to be faithful with my time. I learned in those situations how to, how to preach week after week after week after week as I led the Sunday school, which is another no-no in the new IFB or, or among these church forsakers, let's say. I learned how to get along with people. My understanding of the scriptures grew. I learned how to set an example. I learned how to be an example to others. I grew leaps and bounds. Why? Because I put myself in a church and submitted under the authority that I was there under. It was better than no church at all, 100%, 150%. It's not even a thing, but it was so much better, and yet people still forsake the fellowship. It's, it's hard for me to see eye to eye with these guys. Can you understand? It's hard for me to sympathize with the guy that says, ah, oh, there's no good church in Toronto. It's hard. I served at a United Church of Canada. You know what that means? The biggest denomination in Canada. The LGBT, HYZ, LMNOP, like waving the flag, kicking all the men preachers to the curb so that they can put a lady with a bus cut in there. I served in that church faithfully, week in, week out, for a time. Wow. Okay? So when you come to me and you say, oh, that, that preacher sells stuff in the back, I'm not going to that church. I have no sympathy for those types. Get in church. Get in church. It needs to be preached. It needs to be, we need to be hard on that. So how did I get by in those situations? Why? Because I was not being obedient to a woman preacher. Do you understand? I was not being submissive to a woman preacher. As Romans 13 says, I was obeying the higher authority. Who is the higher authority? Who is the highest authority? It's the word of God. It's Jesus Christ. And what did he say? He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as, as a manner of some is. So much the more as you see that day approaching. So I submitted myself unto, yes, women preachers. Yes, shady pastors who had ulterior motives to their ministry. Yes, I served in those capacities. But it was because I served the Lord Jesus that I was able to do so. It was because, first and foremost, I looked to him for my guidance, and I sat down, and I was a blessing, and I shut my mouth, and I learned something. And, and I don't have, I don't, I'm not picking fights with people here. You're all in church. You're all here faithfully. I see you. I know your situations. I know you. When you're not in church, I can chase you down, and I can bring you in here by force if I need to. But I'm not primarily speaking to you, but what I am telling you is that if our situation here changes, if you guys, for some reason, have to move to a different area, if for some reason... Um, this is swept up. It doesn't exist in the same capacity. If you've got to change churches, whatever, I don't want to hear any of you saying, ah, I don't go to church because there's no good churches. I want you guys to be in church. And anyone who was there when, when, Trinity, or when Trinity split and then after sound words had people leave when we were in the basement, anyone who was there saw me say these exact words that, we are simply a Paul and a Barnabas going separate ways. And I hope and pray to God that as Sound Words goes over here and continues doing what we're doing and continues to be the church that we're being, that you guys will go and you will serve and you will submit and you will be a blessing in a congregation yourself. Yeah. The work is multiplying here and that's good things. Obviously we learned that just leaving a church wasn't the intention of such and such men. Right. But the thing is, is that that was my heart's intent. And it's still my heart's intent. The only reason why I came down here is because men reached out to me and I saw a situation from afar and they said, we just don't know what to do. And I heard for years and years and years, and if we've been together in fellowship online, you've seen me and certain other brethren that are just constantly kicking you guys, saying, get in church. 
the ones that are forsaking. Get in church, the ones that always are slandering and saying, I can't be a blessing. I can't fellowship with that church because such a... Get in church. It's always been my cry. And so I am here to offer you guys that exact thing is that you can be a part of a congregation. That's my heart's desire. And if your heart's desire is to then go and serve in another congregation, it will not hurt my feelings if... You go and serve in another congregation. But if you go and you return to your basement and you return to just listening to YouTube and you don't go to church and you forsake the assembly, that's where my heart's going to get hurt. That's where I'm going to feel like I did something wrong. I have not been what I should be in order to lead you guys in the path that you ought to go in. My desire is that every one of you would be in church. Yeah, I'd love for you to be a part of this fellowship. I'd love for you to be a part of Sound Words Baptist Church. But first and foremost, you've got to be a part of any church. Right. Any church is my desire. So go back to Romans chapter 13. And those are my four points. Sit down, be a blessing, shut up, and learn something. And that's the best way you can be a blessing. That's the best way you can be a success in any church. If you just sit down, be a blessing, shut up, and learn something. Four points. The first point, sit down. That has the idea of being subject, about putting yourself beneath. Look at Romans 13 and verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Be subject. That's what it means to sit down. That's what it means to put yourself a little bit lower. Just sit down. Just be humble. Just be in your spot. Sit down. Be subject. If not, look what it says in verse 2. If not, whosoever resisteth the power, in other words, you're standing up. You're rising up. You're not sitting down. It says here, resisteth the ordinance of God. You are resisting if you go into a church situation and you don't just sit down. You are resisting the ordinance of God, the order of God, the command of God, the decree of God, which is to be subject unto the higher powers. And those that do not, those that refuse to be subject unto the higher powers, receive to themselves damnation. Verse 5 says, Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. So yeah, it is it's a good thing to fear the Lord, for it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But does not your conscience even itself teach you? Does not the inward wrongometer, that, that, that thing that God put in you, does it not tell you that it's just unnatural for you to always be rising up against the power that's over you? The conscience sake is what's being described here, not only for the wrath of God that will come upon you if you're constantly kicking against authorities, but also the conscience of it all. Man, I, I don't know how many times I have been reproved by my own conscience because I kicked against an authority, only to find that authority was right and I was wrong. And then I have egg on my face and I look like an idiot. That's just God working out things in my life. Yes, not giving me the fullness of his wrath, but helping me through my conscience to understand it's just wrong to be constantly kicking against your authorities. Why do we do that? Well, because quite often we're scared to be under the higher power. So when you're in these situations, when you're in a compromised situation, when you're in a situation where you're deciding between whether you're going to be obedient in that church, whether you're going to do what that church is expecting of you, whether you're going to submit to that, any church, you know, like, like I said, any church is better than no church. You need to understand that you are to appeal to the higher power. So if they're asking you to high five, hug on, love on sodomites, okay, now you appeal to the higher authority and you say you got to hate that stuff. But you also have to understand that when you're in that church, I find it hard to believe that every single person within that church is what you're painting out the congregation to be. You're painting them all with the same brush. Do you, do you know that there are probably saved people down at that church? United Church of Canada, even the one right across the road, there are probably blood-bought, born-again believers who are going to that church, whether it's for family reasons, whether it's because it's comfortable, whether it's just because they like an ear-tickling message. Do you not think that you could get into a congregation like that if it were the only situation possible? The only thing you could possibly do to not forsake assembly was to drag your carcass in there and sit down for an hour. Do you not think that God could 
use you to reach out to that one safe person that might already been there. And then you can go, hey, there's two safe people in there. And now you have fellowship one with another. Because you didn't forsake that assembly, because you didn't forsake the meeting, the assembling of ourselves together. But while you're there, you have to sit down. You can't be going about, you can't be stirring up trouble. You can't be, for example, uh, let's say something like buying and selling a church. Many churches we know will have a little thing at the back that has books, maybe with a little thing that says, you know, $5 a book or whatever. They're selling something at the back. Now, we could just as easy look at that and say, huh, that's a den of thieves. They sell stuff. Flip the table on the way out and we're done with it. We're never going to that church again. And now we've got nothing. We got sitting at home eating chips off our chest, watching YouTube. Is that our responsibility, though? Is that our dominion? Is that our purpose and plan when we enter into that congregation? I would say no. I would say it's Jesus' responsibility to take that table, flip it over, and set those things right. Perhaps, yes, it's easy for us to go to that verse, right? We always want to go to the verse that's going to support our feelings at the time. Man, I hate things being in the back. Jesus was mad at, at buying and selling. I'm going to flip this table. And we started acting upon those impulses. But perhaps at that time, that's not the verse that God wants you to deal with. That's not the verse that God wants you to apply to your life. Perhaps it's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Right? Perhaps that's the first that you need to apply to your life in that particular situation. The Christian life is one of longevity. So you may enter into a church, it's your first time there, you're like, I'm shopping churches. Ah, oh, they sell stuff. Dead of thieves. Flip the table, you're out. You're never going back to that church again. Maybe God wanted you to forgive and wink at that in order that 10 months, 12 months, two years down the line, his purpose for you within that congregation would be fulfilled. And the pastor would just go, what in the world have I been doing selling stuff in there? And you see the true fruit of what God was doing. Jesus flipped the table in his life. Jesus stepped in and moved in his life. Why? Because you stepped in, prayed for the man, winked at that, were kind to him, tenderhearted, forgiving him, and you did that first for two years. And in the end, God had his way with man. Because you were there. You were being a blessing. You were doing what you were supposed to do when you were in church. Too often we take verses and we apply them to our lives and then try to act them out as if it's our responsibility to do so. I believe our responsibility is like it says in verse 7 there. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. If it's due, render it. If it's due, give it. If you can walk into a ministry and you're going to pick out something like selling books in the back, why don't you look beyond that and then render dues where they are due? Hey, I like the singing and how people gather together to sing the hymns. Hey, I like the preaching is from the King James Bible. Maybe you could render some dues where they are due in areas that are positive. Instead of just walking into these places and just taking and picking out all of the negative things and then just using it as your battering ram to convince yourself, hey, I don't need to be in church even though it's five minutes from my house. I'm not going to that church ever. Instead, render dues. Give men. Give ministry. Where it's due, credit. Give men. Give ministry. Custom. Fear. Honor. When it's due. Why can't we go into situations that aren't ideal based on our convictions of the Holy Ghost spirit working into us, why can't we then have grace with people? Why can't we extend grace one to another? When in these carnal situations, look at a verse like Ephesians chapter 6. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, if you will. When you're in a situation that seems like it's just, it's just carnal, it's just, it's just worldly, the church isn't where you would like it to be, I'm struggling to, to assemble here. It's just it's trying to be there for that whole hour to hear this watered down message, I don't like it. Maybe Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5 is what you need to apply. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God. Again, if you're the servant of Christ, you will naturally be obedient to your own masters according to the flesh. Colossians chapter 3 says something similar. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. It says this, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the what? The flesh. 
not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Our goal and our desire needs to be to serve the Lord Christ. And if Christ says don't forsake the assembly, and if you're in a spot where you feel there's no good church, maybe you just need to go there and submit yourself and see what God will do in those situations. Because you're not submitting yourselves unto men, you're submitting yourselves unto God. So sit down. Just sit down if you're in a situation where you have to just settle on a church congregation. When you're in a situation where you have to just go in, grin, and bear it. When you're in a situation where you have to just do what God wants you to do for that hour and then you can get home and, and replenish yourself with fine online preaching or whatever kind of supplements you have to help you, Bible reading, etc. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. Obviously I'm not preaching everybody just go and leave here and join a United Methodist Church. <clears throat> what I'm preaching is that we need to understand that, hey, we're not as awesome as we think we are. We're not just like the best Christian and any congregation would just be so incredibly blessed to have us and they're missing out. And so when I walk in, I need everything to be a certain way according to my understanding. If it's not, I'm just going to pass on by, brother. <clears throat> now get in church. Hey, if you, if you have no other choice, if there's nothing else to do, if there's no other congregation to be a part of, you got to find a way to be in a congregation. you got to find a way to be in church. Even the most carnal atmosphere, even the most according to the flesh atmosphere, if you're serving Christ, it's not going to bother you. Every day we go to our jobs, and I bet you your job doesn't, isn't full of people singing hallelujah, having prayer meetings, right? But we go and we submit ourselves unto our boss. We do our job. We serve Christ. We do what we're expected to do, and, and that becomes our ministry as we go out. Why can't we do the same thing in a carnal church? Why can't we have the same attitude in a carnal church when you walk in and they're not singing hallelujah, having prayer meetings, singing glory to God? Why can't you do that same thing when it's according to the flesh? Be a blessing in that area. Look at Ezekiel chapter 22 and beginning in verse 23. The Bible reads, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now remember, we're talking about being in a carnal church atmosphere, okay? This is just an extended application. Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law. They have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. They have hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I am profane among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get honest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. You don't get any more carnal than what's happening right now in the book of Ezekiel. You have prophets who are devouring souls. You have prophets taking treasures, making widows. Is that, is that murder? Yeah. You have priests violating the law, doing violence against the law, hurting and harming the perfect law of God. They are profaning holy things. There's no difference between what's clean and unclean. The princes, the leaders at this time, they're like wolves. They're destroying souls. They're gaining dishonestly. They're seeking after dishonest gain. It says here that there's, there's um, vanity and divining lies coming from the mouth of the spiritual leaders. And yet look at here in verse 30. And I sought for a man among them. 
It doesn't say I saw for a man that had nothing to do with him. That was in a different city that was five minutes away from that situation but wanted nothing to do with it. It said, I saw for a man among them. Among who? Among the prophets that are killing people. Among the priests that are violating the law and, and not have any discernment between clean or unclean. Among the princes that are dishonestly gaining, ripping people off, robbing people. God says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land. And I should not destroy it, but I found none. I found none in this carnal, wicked, no good, rotten, sinful, savage situation. God is still seeking for just one man. Just one man to stand in the gap. And yet we say, ah, I can't go to that church. It's too carnal. It's too wicked. It's too, it's too wrong. It's too savage. It's, there's, there's nothing good over there. There's nothing good in this situation. Yet God's seeking for just one man to be there to stand in the gap. And I will tell you that there ain't no church in this area that is bad, is what's being described here. Yeah. There is nothing as savage where literally the leaders are killing people making widows. We have not seen that type of debauchery yet Amen. in Canada, North America, anywhere. We haven't seen a congregation, we haven't seen a land, a group, that wicked. And yet God still wants and desires that there would be just one righteous man within that. So don't tell me that you don't go to church because all the churches are wicked. Look at this example. Amen. These things are written for our examples upon whom the ends of the earth are come. If we look to this, we say, hey, God wants a carnal world, a carnal atmosphere, a carnal situation to be kept, to be protected, to be made up in the gap, to have someone who is righteous, someone who is good, someone who is decent to stand in that gap. That's our context. That is our application. And when there is that carnal, wicked, terrible church situation, where is our man too often? Where is the man that God's looking for? That man's sitting at home. That man's sleeping in on Sundays. That man's just waiting to download the next sermon. That man's um, maybe getting to his Bible reading sometime around noon. That man is not standing in the gap where he's supposed to be. Amen. That man is at home on the internet trolling. That man is at home being, um, being just, just lazy. That man is being a soul wiener. Instead of being in church, he's going to go out and he's going to knock on doors and try to get numbers and try to puff himself up and post it up. It's like, glory to me and God was there too, I guess. Right? He's trying to lift himself up by spiritual actions. Well, I prayed today. I read my Bible today. I went soul winning today. I'm just as good as anybody else. But you weren't in church. Right? You weren't in church. You weren't standing in that carnal, wicked gap. That's where God wants you. He wants a righteous. He sought for a man. Now look, because he found none, therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. Because someone wouldn't stand in that gap. Because someone who was a righteous believer said there are no good churches, which is a lie. There's just no churches that meet their fanciful standards. Right? They need to, hey, that's, that's the same cry, the same, the same call, the same, the same message that I'm saying in here is, is, hey, loser, get in church. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to stand in that gap. Don't go saying that there's nothing. We have the most carnal situation we could find, and yet God said, hey, go there and be a blessing. What a blessing it would have been for those people if there was that one man standing in the gap and God withheld his wrath. He withheld his punishment. He withheld his correction and destroyed it not. Did not recompense. He extended grace because one man was there. This is even better than Sodom and Gomorrah. He just wanted what? Right? Yet they refuse. Turn to Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3. So instead of being a blessing, the forsakers are too proud. They're puffed up. They're seeking to please only themselves. They're thinking to make a, a, a fair show in the flesh. What are you saying when you say there's, there's no good church in Toronto? I've heard it said, there are no good churches in Canada. You're, you're out of your mind. You're, you are saying that you are better than all of the believers who regularly attend a church Sunday morning, many of them Sunday night and Wednesday night, you're sitting at home going, bah, there's no good churches here. I'm not going to church. You're puffing yourself up. You're a forsaker. You're proud, and you're going to be destroyed. 
They say, oh, I can't go to church. That's a dead church. And I've heard this, this same accusation made, again, in the same context, of churches all over the place, and you're like, there are no good churches. Oh, those churches are dead. First point was, sit down, be humble, submit. The second was, be a blessing. Hey, maybe you can stand in the gap to that congregation. The third point is, shut up. Shut up. You say, oh, that's a dead church. Well, look at Revelation chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis, right? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. So as much as you say, oh, that church is dead, and I don't believe you. Here God is saying that church is dead. Verse 3 says, get out of there. You don't need to be there. Go at home and just, I'll teach you all things that you need to know. That's not what he says there. Verse 2, he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, hast, how hast thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Here, God is affirming that, yes, this is a dead church. Yes, this church is dead. It's struggling. There's nothing left in it. They used to be alive. They used to live. They've got the name and the reputation as if they live, but they're dead. But he doesn't say vacate. He doesn't say get out and join Philadelphia. He doesn't say leave. He doesn't say flee to Ephesus. At least i got people in Ephesus that are doing the works, the first works. He says to the people in Sardis, he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Strengthen those things. He says, watch. And that's his ordinance. That's his command. He says, watch and strengthen. But too often we enter into those situations where there's a dead church. And instead of watch and strengthen, we rest and we try to straighten. Instead of watching and strengthen, in other words, keeping an eye out, praying, watching the prayer, keeping an eye out for the people that are there, standing in the gap for them, watching that dead church, maintaining that dead church, being a beacon of light in that dead church, and instead of then strengthening the things that you do get behind, that you can support, that you want to help with, that you want to lift up, instead of watching and strengthening the things which remain, we rest and we straighten. We twist things up. We, we, we make up our minds about how that's wrong. I'm going to straighten that out. I'm going to sort this out. I'm going to go talk to the pastor. I'm going to talk to the deacons. I'm going to make this place right. This whole thing is rising and falling upon me. It's not the humble approach, and too often that's exactly what we do. If we do, as, as forsakers, darken the door of a church building, we walk in and we go, ha, look at that. Oh, man, look at that. Look what she's wearing. Look what the, the pastor's wife is going to say something like that. Unbelievable. I'm going to sort this out. I'm holding a meeting with them. Hey, nice to meet you. Can I speak with you tonight? <laughs> you just showed up at the place. You, do you understand why somebody might have a bad impression? Because too often these, these fellowship forsakers, when they walk in the situation, they don't say, oh, I don't like this because of this verse, and I don't think that's right because of this verse, and this ain't right because of this verse. They walk in and they'll say, well, Pastor Anderson doesn't do it this way. Roger Jimenez doesn't do it that way. Preacher off the internet doesn't do it this way. I don't agree with that opinion. And they have nothing but their own opinions based on somebody they've never met, vainly puffed up in their own mind as if it's some sort of standard that every church must attain to. And they walk in and they want to rest the situation that they're seeing, and they want to straighten them out. They want to sort them out. And that isn't preached by any of the names that I just mentioned. That isn't preached by one a order of them. They teach the same thing that I'm preaching today. Sit down, be a blessing, shut up, and learn something. That's what you need to do when you go to a church. Man, you shouldn't even be approaching the leadership with beef until you've at least been there for a few months. And so you've at least been fellowship week in, week out for a long series of time. And then when you see a problem, you pray about it. You allow God to settle that in your heart. You try to see if that's something that you can wink at. You pray for the leadership that they would be sorted out by God, that God would enter into their life and flip that desk over. That God would enter into their life and give them the word that they need to understand. And you rest, you watch, right? You pray and you give it that time and then you see what is good there. 
as you're praying and you're watching and you're caring for and you're ministering to people and you're being a blessing, you're trying to do everything you can to get with the program and you say, you know what, I would like to sing and minister in that area. And you join into that group and everyone's stone deaf and you just happen to have a voice and so you start to help them build that up. And then you look over here and you see, hey, they're trying to reach out to teenagers who are troubled, who are on drugs and alcohol. I... I feel a burden for that. I want to get in there. And maybe they don't have a younger person that is more able to get and reach those people. So you get involved in that ministry. You build them up. You lift them up. You try. You should be watching and you should be strengthening the things that remain that are ready to die. Don't give me that church is dead garbage and then sit at home doing nothing for the Lord. Because that honestly... I can't imagine God blessing the fruit of somebody that goes out and says, I want 200 people to the Lord with my friends. Hallelujah for my friends and I. And then says, yeah, and God was there too. But those people were never in church. How is God going to bless something like that? It's me, 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 I, I, I. No one else was helping me. In spite of everybody else fighting against me. You're vain, you're puffed up, you're wicked, and that's wrong. You need to get into a church, have the church have the blessing behind you to rally people up, to go out, to seek, to save that which is lost, so that you can actually bring them somewhere instead of inviting them. Hey, why don't you just watch these DVDs like I do? I don't go to church. Why don't you come sit in my basement? We'll do a Bible study. That kind of garbage. Come on, man. That's not right. There is nothing that you can say to me to convince me that you are right by not going to church to just sit at home and do nothing. But you do so when you do pray. Hey, I don't, I don't care if you get a thousand people one in a year. You're not in church. You're a fellowship forsaker. It's wicked. You're outside of God's will. Amen. That's my third point. Shut up. We need to go into these situations. If we're ever, God forbid, in a situation where we don't see eye to eye with every doctrine of the church that we're attending, we don't need to go in there and stir up strife the moment we get there. The Bible says here in verse 4, it says, Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. You notice how the people are there in that dead church, but there are still a few names that are not defiled on their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And I believe that that is a pra practical and present blessing to those people. That, that they would walk worthy. That they would be cleansed. That they would be serving God. It doesn't say that they walked in and they took all those dead things and, and, and gave their 100 theses against it. No, it says that they watched. It says that they strengthened. And it says that they didn't defile their garments. In other words, they walked not in strife. Like Romans 13, 13 says, it says, walk not in strife, but put ye on the Lord Jesus and make not provision for the flesh. Because what happens is when we start running our mouths, when we start going in with all of our ideals, with all of our opinions, all of our concerns about the church and about their leadership, all we are doing is puffing up ourselves. Put ye on the Lord Jesus, make not provision for the flesh. But when we enter into those debates, when we enter into those strivings, when we go at the rightful leadership with our beef, even though we just showed up on his doorstep moments ago, we are puffing ourselves up. We are making provision for our flesh. We are vainly giving them our opinion. And the Bible is very clear in 2 Timothy 2 verse 14. It says, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words for no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And that's my charge to you now today. If you're ever in a situation where you got to choose between going to this okay church and this okay church, X, Y, and Z, and you're going to make that decision, don't enter into strifes about words of no profit. Go in, be a blessing. Go in, sit down, submit them to the leadership that you have to in as much as you can, knowing that God is the higher power, and shut your mouth. Study the show thyself approved unto who? God. God, the workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You don't need to study to, to show yourself approved unto men. Right. You need to stand before the Lord with a clear conscience that you are, Lord, I don't, I, I, I don't know, even know how to submit 
to this woman preacher. It's not biblical, but this is the only church. I live in the middle of Saskatchewan, and there are 50 people in my city, and they elected the one woman with a bus cut hair to put a rainbow on her. How would I even not forsake that assembly? It's horrible. It's wicked. Hey, study to show yourself a proven to God, a work that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and enter not into strives about words of no profit. I'm telling you, that's not an ideal situation. And if I was in that situation, I'd drive eight hours to get into a good church. I'd move to get into a good church. But not everybody has that opportunity. But I am certain that the man that is in a town of 50 and there's only one woman preacher could get in there, sit down, shut up, be a blessing, be humble, struggle through that hour of her yippity yapping so that he could at least not be forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. And I believe that that person would be in God's will and God would do great things. Supplement is important. And this is what I believe whether you're in a great church or whether you're in a poor church. The most important learning you will ever do is on your own with the Holy Spirit of God teaching you. God doesn't want you to come to be in church so that you can just hear everything from me and be able to parrot all the things that Brother Josh believes. He wants you to be in church because he doesn't want you to forsake the assembly. He doesn't want you to forsake the fellowship. He doesn't want you to forsake what's going on here. And yes, you are going to glean. You are going to grow. You are going to hear some things and go, hey, uh, that's a nice, an interesting way of taking that scripture. That's interesting. I'm going to, and here's the next most important thing, study that out. I'm going to study that out. And that's what we need to do with everything that happens here, is go home and study that out. But not so that you can come back and strive to your leadership. Not so you can come back and strive to that hypothetical lesbian with. You, you don't need to constantly be trying to enforce your beliefs in order to push your own agendas. And that's my final point, is that you would learn something. Remember, folks, you don't know it all. You don't know it all. That's a reminder that we all need to understand. You don't know it all. But when we go into a church situation where we, it's maybe not ideal, where we had to kind of pick, oh, this is the lesser of two evils, this place doesn't seem right, you can still learn something. Why? Because most of your learning, most of your growth, even in that dead church, is going to come by way of this teaching of the Holy Spirit of God in you. When you go into one of these situations, you need to learn something. Do you know what we learn by entering into a congregation, into a fellowship, even if it's not ideal, even if it, it's, it's worldly and carnal as all get out, and you're the only beacon of light there, and you believe that God probably put you there just so you would stand in the gap so that these people aren't killed by them? Even if that's your situation, God forbid, you learn to be punctual. You learn to be personable. You learn the great potential that you have to grow. You learn to be humble. You learn to serve. You learn to pray. You learn to love. You learn to be normal. And this is the thing that so many people that sit at home and just watch sermons are missing out on, is they have no response. They have no communication. They have no fellowship with legitimate real people. And they aren't punctual. <laughs> they aren't personable. They're proud as heck. They, they don't serve, they want to be served, right? Because that's the, that's the attitude that walks into a congregation. It says, well, what are you going to do for me, right? They don't love anybody. They're not normal. They're weird. They're strange. They're bizarre. People that sit at home just watching internet sermons all the time, they're some of the strangest people. And we've seen that. We've seen that come out in the last couple weeks where you're like, okay, this situation has to do with a church that lost their pastor because of wicked sins. But... Man, these like internet weirdos and trolls are just coming out of the woodworks. It's like it's like the great swarm of re locusts from Revelation. All these trolls are just coming out. Like, where do they even come from? Why do they believe such crazy things? Why are they all swarming and congregating in the same place? Bizarre. But why though? Why does this happen? Because these people never learned anything. You come here and you learn some from me, okay? You're going to learn some doctrine. You're going to learn some preaching and teaching that will apply to your life. And that's my desire is to help you guys best I can in that area. But I learn the most when I sit down with the Bible in front of me and I learn these things so that I can present them to you. And that's not some special anointing, some special power given to the, the person that says, I submit myself to lead this congregate. No, that's everyone that has that opportunity to go home. And maybe you're not going to put it into three or four points and make a sermon out of it, but you're going to be able to take a Bible truth and break it down into three or four Bible truths that reinforce that. And then you're going to take that practical understanding and you're going to walk with it. 
The people that forsake fellowship, the people that sit at home, the people that don't go to church because there's no good church in the area, they don't have any of that. And so the reason why we see all these people acting really weird, is first and foremost, they are really weird. But secondly, because they've put their whole faith, they've put their whole trust, they've put their whole understanding into one man or into two men and how they preach and reason out of the scriptures. What happens then is when somebody, and we're independent Baptist, somebody has a differing view of a scripture, presents their case, and they have Bible just as much as this guy has Bible. They have uh, prayed over it just as much as that guy's prayed over it. But the internet weirdo in the middle sees two conflicting ideas. I just put my entirety of my belief on what Pastor X said, and now Pastor Y is saying something completely different. And then he's never had a firm foundation of the Word of God, so he's like, yeah, amen, yeah. Ooh, what the, that guy's a heretic, that guy's a heretic. Well, what happens if this guy starts saying something that doesn't line up with what he understood about that guy? No, he's a heretic, they're all heretics. And they end up being weird social recluses, which end up trash canning themselves and compiling into one swarm of revelation. Locusts. They just go about trolling and being weird and, and bothering people and swarming. And it's because they've never put themselves in a church. They've never had a firm foundation. They've never used the teaching and preaching that they've gained at the church to go and do something practical with it. They've never put feet to the truths that they've had. No, they've always just had, okay, this is my guy. This is his opinion. This is what I'm going to stand on. Oh, but what about this guy? Okay, I'm going to go for this guy now. He's my guy. He's my, I love his opinion. Oh, well, this guy's a little. And they just are constantly torn between the two things. Right. We're independent Baptists. You know that I can love my pastor who's pre-trib, and I can love some of my preacher friends who are mid-trib pre or post-trib pre-wrath. I can love them both and have conversations about doctrine with them both. I can talk about the timing of the rapture with them both. And I don't go, oh, he's right. No, he's right. I don't like him. I don't like, oh, no. And I'm torn between that. Why? Because I'm standing right here in the middle, loving that guy and what I can reason with him and understand about his position and loving him as a person because I fellowshiped with him. And I know him personally. Same as the guy over here. I can love him, have fellowship with him, be in, be in, be in cohoots, work with, labor with him. Why? Because I stand here on the word of God. Amen. I'm not budging on the word of God. My understanding comes from the Word of God. And I've gleaned a lot of great things from Pastor Palace. And I've gleaned a lot of great things from Internet Preacher. But they're never going to conflict where I have to just choose sides. Why? Because my foundation is sure upon the Word of God. And it all comes from the point where, yeah, I've learned something from him. I've learned something from him. But the Internet Fundamental Baptist is just going to be tossed to and fro. He's going to be carried about with every wind because he set his feet upon sand, and when this wave comes and starts teaching him something, he'll go this way, and this one teaches something, he'll go this way, and he's constantly in this state of turmoil, and what happens in the end of it all is just destruction. The sand just gives way, and he falls, and, and he's ruined, and he's destroyed, just as God promised would happen. Forsaking the assembly is a command. Submitting to the higher powers is a command. It's an ordinance. It's an order. You're supposed to be in church. You're supposed to be in the house of God. No church baloney. There is always a congregation of believers that you can assemble with and you can submit yourself under. Don't give me that garbage. I've lived it. <laughs> so you need to, if you're ever in that situation, you need to learn something. You need to shut up, you need to be a blessing, and you just sit down and respectfully submit in whatever area you're in. It's the only way, honestly, that someone's going to be normal. Why? Because if somebody starts getting really weird ideas, but they're going to church every week, maybe they just have one friend there that is saved, and everything else around them is worldly, carnal, rock band, like just, just Ezekiel chapter 22 all over again, right? Just the worst kind of carnality possible, but they have one saved friend there and they go there every week and they sit through it and they're like, man, this is vexing my soul, but I can't wait to get home and listen to a decent sermon and pray and read my Bible, but praise the Lord, I'm not forsaking the fellowship. And then his friend goes, hey, what do you think about the flat earth? And everyone goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> Wake up, come on. Gives him a smack upside his flat head, right? It straightens you out. 
It makes you normal. And this is why God did it. He didn't do it. Again, so you can just come and listen to, to uh, Pope Josh give his uh, exegesis and all these kind of weird, like, this is exactly what we all need to believe, and I am going to decree it. No, that's not, we came so that we can fellowship with one another. We can work with one another. We can be with one another. We can care for one another. We can grow with one another. And, and, and I submit to you that, that while I would love nothing more than for everyone here to make this their home for that, to make this their church, I believe we're the best church in Toronto. I believe that we are the foundations of the best church in Toronto. I believe that with my whole heart. This is why I'm here, because I have always desired to be in the best, best church in my area. And that's why I drove an hour to London. That's why I drive an hour and a half to here. I desire this to be my congregation, where I will submit myself to authorities as need be, where I will submit myself one with another, where I will grow, be taught, learn, love, where I will do all the things that church is supposed to do for us and, 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 and through us and in us. I'll be personable. I'll learn of my potential. I'll be humble. I'll grow. I'll serve. I'll love. This is where I want that to happen. But if we're ever in a position, if any of you are in a position, it would hurt my heart if you were to just leave here having what we have, having the fellowship, the, the camaraderie, the understanding, the growth that we've done together, the love we have on us, having this and to just go and sit at home and never go to church. That would be the worst thing for me. If someone goes, you know what, hey, it's, it's a long ways to drive to get here. I'm going to submit to the authority that God has put in my life here in this church. And it's not the best church, but I believe God wants me here. If a man can at least say that with an honest heart and say, hey, look, it's not the greatest church, but this is where I'm going to serve. This is where I'm going to submit. This is where I am going to put myself out there, where I'm going to sit down. I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to learn something. And I'm just going to do what God wants me to do. If someone does that, I, I'm all for that. And, and you know, that, that's what I was for in the beginning. Hey, if you guys want to go and, and do your own thing, just be in church. Just be in church. Just be in church. Why? Because if we're forsaking, all of this falls apart. And you become a weird internet troll. It's not what I want for any of you. I don't want any of us to just remove ourselves from the fellowship of, of good, like-minded, Bible-believing believers that can lift each other up, pray for one another, support one another, encourage one another. I don't want you to forsake that. And if it's not with me, hey, my feelings aren't hurt. Go get that somewhere else. you got to be in church. Be in church. Hey, get in church. Father,